Thanks ever so much. This is a slightly odd thing to stick at the end of uh, a very, very interesting day. And uh, thank you for, for, for Sri and uh, Rajesh for inviting me to talk about this. Um, slight change of tack. We're going to be talking about VATS in the context of thoracic uh, trauma, emergency trauma. And we're all very aware that thoracic injuries make up uh, up to 25% of, of all trauma deaths. And, and it's uh, recognised as a contributory factor for 25% of, uh, of deaths overall. So, so it's, it's an important area for us to concentrate our, our attention on as, as thoracic surgeons. And with that, you've heard all today about some wonderful thoroscopic techniques that have been developed by some very eminent surgeons. And if we apply some of these techniques and some of these skills that we're developing as, as, as keyhole surgeons, we, we can make a difference to some of, the, some of these trauma patients that we're seeing uh, in our trauma centers. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the VAT's role in trauma. Um, within the scientific literature over the last two decades, there are several hundred papers describing the role of VATs in the context of trauma. Um, a lot of those pa papers are small case series. You, you recognize the sorts of papers I'm talking about. This is just an example, which is a decent, decent paper, quite a recent paper, looking at the role of VATs uh, in the context of blunt thoracic trauma. And they're small case series, small volume, and we all recognize these sorts of papers. This is one particular paper which I happen to point, pick up on, and this is dealing with the role of um, looking at patients using a, a VATS assessment in patients who have presented with blunt chest trauma and penetrating chest trauma who are otherwise hemodynamically stable. And this is a Professor Yim's paper. And you can't read this, I do apologise, but it basically shows different types of patients presenting with different sort of traumatic injuries. The majority were blunt, some were uh, penetrating thoracic trauma, and the overriding uh, factor with these pa patients were they were in, generally in hemodynamically stable state. Um, and this is an algorithm that he suggested for, on the back of this uh, relatively large series of uh, patients that he looked at, where patients would be assessed um, have their chest train put in for their blunt or penetrating chest injury, having had their radiological assessment for their hemothoraces or whatever the other injury was, and then based on their st stability and their likelihood of not having a significant vascular injury, they were then go going on and having a VATS exploration over an open thoracotomy. And of course, on occasion, patients who are very hemodynamically un unstable were having a resuscitation area thoracotomy performed as well. And this is the sort of algorithm that I grew up as a trainee and I, and I recognize uh, in my VATS training uh, in various places around the world. And uh, this is a sort of typical patient. I just plucked this one out of the air um, yesterday evening. It's a patient who came into uh, St. George's Hospital a few months ago. He was, uh, actually worked for Bacardi. Um, and he fell over down, down the stairwell um, of the party that he was attending. Uh, right side of the chest wall bruising in severe pain, pitched up to the A&E department with that sort of chest x-ray. And with hindsight, you can see a little few rib fractures there. He went on and had his um, uh, obligatory chest CT scan, which of course every patient now gets as soon as they walk into the emergency room. And it showed with the reconstructions, he actually had some undisplaced lower uh, sternal, uh, lower rib fractures on his right side. Um, and I, I'm a strong advocate for, for off, uh, making sure patients do get bony reconstructions on their uh, trauma series. And we, we, we've really pushed that at St. George's to try and help us uh, identify these individuals. Um, and we admitted him under thoracic surgery. We were part of the Integrated Thoracic uh, Trauma Service at St. George's. He had his uh, particular um, type of analgesia that we, we use at St. George's, which is an intrathecal spinal injection prior to um, anesthesia. Uh, he had a two ports of axe exploration, evacuation of his clot, chest x-ray next day, uh, chest x-ray discharge two days uh, with analgesia. And that's a typical kind of patient that we all recognize. This is not clever stuff. I, I hate to follow people like Rene and last year it was Diego. I always seem to be the kind of meat and potatoes kind of speaker, but that's, that's, that's who I am. So this is a very real life kind of character that you see every day. And I expect this is the sort of case that you're all going to be doing VATS procedures on uh, in terms of evacuation of their blood clot and dealing with their, their, their otherwise straightforward traumatic blunt chest trauma injury. Um, so, uh, so it's fairly straightforward. We've, we've fairly much established what we're looking at. We're looking at patients who are hemodynamically stable. We're looking at both blunt majority, occasionally penetrating, 
uh, you're offering them an exploration, usually to, to clear, up, clear out their clot, uh, to deal with minor vascular injuries, typically intercostal type injuries, occasionally uh, mammary, occult mammary injuries, I've had that once or twice, occasionally even lung parenchymal injuries, which require some surgical exploration beyond simple chest drainage, and also increasingly a recognition that you may pick up occult injuries early, uh, particularly classically diaphragmatic injuries. So that's a fairly established practice, and it's, no, and it, and it's nothing very clever, it's not pioneering. Um, but it also has limitations, and this is a, a, a wonderful case that uh, came in through our RNA department about a year ago. Uh, he actually was the delivery driver for McLaren, I kid you not. And he crashed his uh, 250,000 um, uh, pound um, road McLaren um, in, the Surrey, in the Surrey Hills somewhere and impaled himself on the fence post. So that certainly isn't, even Dr. Peterson would struggle with a VATS approach for that. So um, that was a, a challenge. Um, and. Um, so clearly VATS has a role. Um, and what I was interested in um, for this talk was really to explore this issue. Now this is um, a publication from NICE. It's been upgraded, uh, uh, upgraded recently in October 2010, looking at the evidence for rib fixation. And that's something I'm particularly interested in. And it's an area which I think VATS can really possibly impinge on, on developing our thoracic surgical practice within the context of trauma. And this, this, this um, scientific, this paper that was generated by NICE had some of the evidence around the role of rib fixation, of which most of the evidence is based on the intubated, mechanically compromised patient on the ITU setting. So, so this is just uh, uh, for your reading list to have a look at that particular publication. Um, I, I'm not a, a pioneer in this. I've, I've, Tom Routage at Guys has done a lot more rib fixations than I have. Um, particularly uh, John Edwards in Sheffield and, and Ed Black in Oxford have really led the way in terms of developing rib fixations. I've kind of come along partly by, by default. Um, the, the, the month after I, or a month after I, or the month before I started at St George's, we became a, a major trauma centre. We're now part of a network within the, within the southwest corridor of, uh, of Greater London. Uh, we got a helicopter. We got a free um, leader of the uh, future leader of the um, Conservative Party got thrown in with that helicopter, um, uh, which has now been built onto our um, onto our management offices, which we're really pleased about because it makes so much noise and vibration. That they they suffer, not us. But uh, that lands on on St George's. I'm told up to 14 times a day now, so it really is a busy place for trauma. And our trauma service has just exploded. Uh, for good and bad um, um, effects. Um, so, and also, there's been a greater interest in the role of rib fixation, particularly around um, Professor Moran, who is leading on the Centia Clinical Reference Group around major trauma for the UK. And we had our sort of first meeting to discuss thoracic trauma and rib fixation. And I was late, it was in Birmingham. I walked in the room about uh, some people, Mike was there, a few other people were there, about 30 or 40 people in the room, I would say half, maybe two-thirds thoracic surgeons, one-third orthopaedic surgeons. And as I walked in, some orthopaedic surgeon had his hand up saying, why are the thoracic surgeons here? And I just saw it, oh, here we go again. So, um, so it was an interesting meeting, and, and certainly we need to be part of this discussion around management of thoracic trauma. I think it's super important. So this is our experience. Uh, I apologise, it's small numbers. So we, we started performing rib fixations back in 2011. Um, very small numbers. Um, we're now up to about 34 cases as of last month, and we've just published some data around uh, a, a, a 24, 24 patient case series. Just our kind of experience around the role of VATS in the context of dealing with thoracic trauma. Um, we're part of this integrated thoracic surgical service, so I, I actually, um, as a unit between the three thoracic surgeons, uh, shortly to become four, we admit around 25 to 30 patients a month for thoracic trauma, of which only a small number of patients, of course, require operation, but they require thoracic management. So in terms of our practice, it's becoming a bigger issue. And I know there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in the January meeting, around what sort of unit you run and how can you how can you deal with these sorts of patients in your unit when you're trying to take out lung cancers every day? So, so it, and, and this is our, our kind of growth rate. And certainly when we first started, not many cases, you know, typical kind of rather typical VATS lobectomy curve onto it. Um, but certainly we're now uh, extending our, our practice significantly. And we're, we'll be up to probably around 50 to 55 cases a year, probably by the end of this year at, at this current rate. So it does have an impact on, our, on, our, on my practice and, our, and, and on St. George's thoracic surgical practice. 
Um, what about these demographics? So we're typically offering surgery in that sort of age group, which I guess would fit within a, a blunt chest trauma age group. The majority, I think, if not all of these patients were blunt chest trauma, actually. Um, a usual ratio between men and women. Um, and that's the sort of um, uh, demographic they were seeing, though I suspect that will get older as, as, as these things tend to get. Um, the type of injury that we're seeing within our Greater London practice is road traffic accidents. That is a particular... Um, they used to, I used to have one of those in London. They used to call me the living heart donor when I used to ride that through central London. So, um, so I, that's certainly, and, uh, that's certainly a, a, a significant um, uh, factor in generating work for us. Um, falls are very common. Alleged assaults, if you haven't, sorry, I misspelled it. If you happen to live around St George's, you know what I mean, alleged assaults means, because it's a common, common thing to happen around where I live. Um, and the type of referrals that we're seeing, typically we're seeing them directly from the emergency room as they come through the door, or within that first 24-hour period within the, within the ITU environment. We work very closely with our Tino group, and we've got a, a really good service now um, with, our, with our orthopedic trauma surgeons in trying to develop a very integrated practice. And we also see referrals from general surgery and occasionally late referrals, uh, usually once the patient's been discharged and has been left with chronic pain issues. So of which, as I mentioned, almost all of our cases have been blunt chest trauma. Um, our average, this is interesting, this is our average length of time between injury and surgery. So we were struggling to get our patients done in time. We were usually finding out about them around two days after they were, were admitted with their injuries, typically. And then we were, by the time we got to see them and by the time, time we managed to find a slot for them in theatre and we were using our thoracic theatres and essentially using our, our elective lists to try and find some time to operate on these patients, it was around eight days by the time we got to operate on them, which if you, if you did learn about bones, which I've been learning a lot about bones uh, in the last couple of years, um, is not necessarily the right time to be operating on bones. They start to get a little sticky by, the, by this stage, but it's still relatively straightforward to operate on patients at that point in time. So a week after an injury, you can still operate on those patients and get a nice result without struggling too much in the context of their ongoing in healing process, particularly in relation to bad refractions. We're now down in, the last, in, in our last sort of four-month cohort, which I looked before I came today, we're at about just under a week now. So we are getting a little better as we get a little bit more organized. As more of our, more of, well, we all, all three of us now do these operations, it's a little easier to kind of get them through the system um, without disrupting our, 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 our daily work too much. So indications for surgery. Um, Often, honestly, it's a combination of all three. This is the big question that we often get asked, particularly in our kind of trauma meetings. You know, wh what patients do you want? Well, at the moment, I, I kind of saying, well, let's talk to me about all your patients if you wish. We're not entirely sure what those indications are. Certainly, the, the evidence that NICE based its papers on, which I showed you earlier, are actually based on a completely different cohort of patients than this particular group of patients who are usually self-ventilating, and that is the mechanically compromised patient on an ITU ventilated. That We do operate on those patients, but the vast majority of our patients are coming through the TNO service, having been uh, admitted to a trauma orthopedic ward or to ourselves, normally requiring that kind of HCU environment where they're requiring oxygen therapy, they're requiring significant analgesia, and they're in clear pain and developing the complications of that problem with pain in their chests. So it's often a combination of these things. Severe pain, I think, is a very important indication, uh, but these are other surrogates to, that we look for. I haven't included um, significant rib destruction or or comminution of the ribs, that's another important one. If the ribs look at, uh, otherwise uh, in alignment and aren't too, too, you know, too distracted, that also has an implication on, on, on how we think they're going to do long term. And I think that probably reflects their issues with chronic chest wall instability and pain long term. And, and, and again, we're looking at operating on those patients earlier than later in general. So, um, interoperative findings. So, this is, this is interesting. This is one of the things I got a little bit hot under the collar in Birmingham in January. I, got, you know, I just walked in to find the orthopod telling me to leave. Um, and um, and um, one, of the things that, that I, one of the things I think VATS is so important for is it allows you to assess the, the, the pleural cavity. A lot of these patients were having significant pleural collections, hemothoraces essentially, of over a litre typically, of which a lot had drains in. 
uh, usually put in by the a &E team or somebody similar around that period of their admission, usually occasionally associated with a thoracostomy. Um, so, uh, so these patients were inadequately being drained, um, and that, of course, has a significant impact on their respiratory state. Um, we have had five cases now of occult severe interthoracic uh, injuries. This has been one example. This actually, um, this is me being a bit slow. I should have realised there was going to be a problem here. Um, and um, it wasn't reported that the rib was actually within the lung itself, within the lung parenchyma, and, and, and we discovered that interoperatively, but in, in hindsight, a little bit more careful examination of the radiology probably would have told me that. Um, but these are the sorts of injuries we're seeing. Um, chest wall hematomas, we've had a few. Diaphragmatic tears, we've had two now. One particularly, which where, where, the, where it was missed on radiology, as is the nature of diaphragmatic injuries. The, the diaphragm looked intact um, at, on their uh, admission um, trauma series. Um, about three days later, patient doing poorly on the, in the HD environment, um, and we did uh, our standard approach, and we popped the scope in, and there, lo and behold, there was small bowel contents in, in the chest coming through a small diaphragmatic tear, which we had been missed, as is, the, as is the nature of diaphragmatic injuries, as you know. So, so it's a useful, absolutely useful adjunct, the role of VATS. And this is a typical patient. He's got a significant right, right flank hematoma and bruising. Um, what we tend to do is uh, a two-port VATS approach, usually going somewhere away from the significant injury and, I'm an anterior surgeon, so I do, everything's from the front, so everything gets put in, in, in the usual spot in the anterior lateral area, usually around the fourth or fifth interspace, typically for the first incision. Um, this is the sort of thing we, we, we find. We, we do an assessment, so we look at the diaphragm. These are the patient's ribs. This guy's actually got very minimally displaced ribs, and I didn't go on and fix his ribs, just, just, to, just to let you know. But, but what you can see is a large collection of blood in his chest cavity. He was done approximately seven to eight days after his original injury. Um, but what we're doing is assessing the injuries and deciding what we're going to do in relation to his rib fractures in the context of his radiology. Um, at the same time, once I've drained, the, once I've made the assessment, I, I, I will go on and place my drain or drains um, at this point. So before I even start fixing the ribs, I'll put my drains in at the time of the VATS procedure. I always use a paravertebral catheter in these patients, which gets inserted under VATS guidance. Um, and and very importantly, if, if I go on and fix the ribs, I will, I will then needle the chest cavity and work out where the, the maximal extent of rib fractures are to s allow me to place a reasonably small thoracotomy scar. So this is a typical kind of thoracotomy scar. It's in the, this one, I think it's, I think it's lateral, uh, so do apologize. Um, and this is um, a, in preparation uh, about to do a three or four rib fixation of this patient. And that's the sort of incision that we would make having assessed them first through the thoroscope to work out where we're going to place our incision. Yeah? So that's the sort of approach we're using. So, very, so the VATS is very much as an aid to, to a thoracotomy to perform our rib fixation. Um, don't get paid by this organization. Happened to be owned by Johnson Johnson, but Synthase is who I use. When I first started, um, so we, we do the dissection of preparation as you saw on, on, the, on the video. Uh, we use the matrix rib system. Um, I did start with Stratos um, and didn't really get on with it in the first couple of cases, although we actually excluded, that, excluded those in our first 24 patients, which we're just publishing now. Um, and this is the approach. It's uh, pretty straightforward. It's, it's not particularly difficult. You, you, you measure the, the depth of the rib, work out which self-locking cortical screw that you're going, you require for your rib. I tend to use a universal plate, though the, the uh, manufacturer does provide plate specific uh, for each rib. Um, and I tend to use a single plate uh, and, and on occasion have to plate more than one fracture of the same rib, if that makes sense. Um, so I tend not to use rib-specific plates, so you can. We've also, we're quite early adopters in using this MEPO system, which is actually, if you ask my MaxFax colleagues, they've been using it forever. But basically, it allows you to do percutaneous incisions. So this is a slightly larger thoracotomy scar, early days, where we're dropping in this, this, this percutaneous drill set, which allows us to drill through the skin, if you like, and come through and hold the plate further down. It just means you avoid an extra three or four inches in terms of the scar anteriorly and posteriorly. And it's quite to use good adjunct to try to keep that thoracotomy scar um, uh, of a decent size. And, and certainly when you first start this, you, you look at the size of the thoracotomy scar you first make, you think, geez, that's the biggest hole I've ever made, particularly as, like, as a vatsalobectomy surgeon. So, so it's something you, you work hard on to try and keep the mobility of the surgery down. 
Um, so, and, and I don't get too worried about where the ribs are. This, this is a typical kind of lateral type rib fractures that we've done of a guy who fell off his ladder doing his window cleaning job. Um, and I don't, I've not had to fix um, at the spine. People often get worried about these sorts of rib fractures, which um, are fractured at the level of the transverse process or just, just shy of. And people get very worried about that. But again, I've not really, probably because I'm too ignorant, I don't worry too much about those either. And, and I've been just placing those in the usual fashion. What is important, however, as you can quite clearly see, is your incision. You've got to be so careful with your incision because suddenly you're you know, doing a huge sort of very lazy old kind of pancosi style incision here to try and access these ribs. You don't need to do that. If you, if you use the camera first and work out where you're going to place your incision, you can pretty much get up, up and down the chest wall quite, quite comfortably. So that's a typical kind of um, X-ray uh, interoperative picture that we are, end up with. Um, that's our kind of OR time. It does take a chunk out, out of your day, and that's important when you're trying to run an elective service. Um, we've, we've done a few, increasingly we're doing them with the, with the neurosurgeons and the orthopedic surgeons as combined procedures when they're going to the OR um, for other reasons. That's actually me being a bit naughty because they do it in the CPOD list. So I can sneak over to the CPOD list and not, and not interrupt my theatre list to, to do these combined procedures. We, we, we typically find around six to seven ribs fractured in the patients we're, we're offering surgery to. We are, on average, fixing between three and four ribs. You often find by the time you've fixed, and, and you have to reduce the ribs and then fix them, and by the time you get to the third or fourth rib, you find that all the other ribs are starting to become in aligned, and, they're, and they become less displaced. So you often find you don't need to fix all the ribs. It's not that kind of case. So you probably fix 50 to 60% of the ribs that you find broken, typically. Um, we've had one patient who had to go back to theatre for evacuation of a clot, which we did VATS um, post-surgery. Otherwise, our morbidity has been very low, and we've had no mortality. Um, length of stay, that's interesting. Uh, like vats lobectomies, you know, when you first start, you get so enthused by the, the patient you do an operation like this on, and next day they're ready to go home. And I've certainly had a few of those kind of cases. Certainly the analgesia is, aspects are super important in these patients. For, you must mobilize them, you must get them physiotherapy. Um, and also whether, where they're returning to also will have an impact on your length of stay, of course. Um, Follow-up data. So far of the data we've looked at, the 24 patients, we've had one patient who, who, knew, who had some neuropraxic problems uh, with chronic thoracotomy style pain, uh, which was put on gabapentin um, long term. Um, that's the only r real issue so far that we've had. So that's kind of real data for, from a, a centre that's starting to do this operation. Um, so VATS has been established in thoracic cert trauma for a long time. Um, the need of thoracic surgeons to be increasingly involved in thoracic trauma, and I think that's really important. Staffing is an issue. These are going to, if you start doing this operation regularly, it's going to have an impact on your service. VATS at the moment is a fantastic aid to rib fixation, and I strongly recommend it, um, partly for the issue of, of, of rib assessment in terms of where you place your incisions for your rib fixation, relation to the pleural drainage and the analgesia aspects of the surgery, as well as dealing with any interthoracic complications from their original injury, which may have been missed. Um, what I really want to know about, and this is where we're going, is this issue of VATS internal fixation. And I know I was talking to Ross earlier, trying to get some information. Um, there is out there people who are now experimenting on fixing ribs internally. And that's, Reddy's done one, done one, you've seen it? I mean, you just look into the pleural cavity and think, this looks really straightforward. And um, it also has the, a slight advantage that the orthopedic surgeons can't do it. So, um, <laughs> so, I, so I, I think that's the future. And as a VAT surgeon, I think that's going to be great to do. And, and the number of times I've done this, and you, you're moving the whole of the chest wall internally with a VATS camera, you see the whole thing moving, and you're just thinking, wouldn't it be nice to put a plate inside and, you know, and fix them in, from inside out? And I think that that will be the future. And hopefully next year... Ross will allow me to see the, 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 the research videos and we can present some data on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ian, Rene, do you want to come to the front? Good, good. Before too many people leave. So uh, thank you very much for everyone keeping on time. Um, and we're pretty much on time. Yeah, questions? Hold on, just wait for the microphone. So, I, don't, I don't know how much of the research is going up. I think that uh, absorbable or biodegradable plates would be the 
next step as well. Yeah. Okay. I've tried a few fancies on this, but they've got a lot of confusions and one line. I've been, they've been getting a little bit hypoxic. Yeah, I mean, very good point, Joel. I mean, we, we don't always do these with one line ventilation because of that issue. Um, and we have had problems with, with ventilation du during the surgery. Um, certainly why I do the VATS is to clear their pleural cavity because once you've done the in, 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 internal bits, so you've cleared, the pleural, you've cleared the pleural cavity, you've assessed the interthoracic cavity, you've put appropriate analgesia in terms of catheters in, you've put your drains in, then you can let the lung go up. So what we're doing is one lung ventilation initially, which hopefully will be relatively short, and then when you're doing your rib fixation, having you know, made, made your incision based on where your ribs are, need to be fixed, then you're on two lungs. So that's the reason we do it that way around, for that very reason, just, just to speed things up in terms of the amount of time they're on single lung ventilation. They don't need to be on vent single lung ventilation for the rib fixation. So, Ian, you've worked quite hard to reduce the size of your incisions and talking to my orthopaedic colleagues they're really keen to do the the same thing so if you look at when they plate the fractured femur now it used to be from knee to thigh and now they could do a two centimeter incision at the bottom and two centimeter incision at the top that's what's that's, that that's going to be the alternative to internal yeah. fi 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 fixation um, I mean, the chest cavity doesn't lend itself to, to that kind of approach mm. that easily. I mean, mm. I, I, we've all tried to, whether it's, you know, you're, you're doing a pectus canatum or some such, where you've tried to sneak under the chest, into the mm. chest cavity, under the, into the chest wall, under the soft tissues. It doesn't lend itself very well to allowing soft tissue expansion, etc., mm. to operate thor thoroscopically out in, in the chest wall itself. Mm. So I think the obvious thing is some sort of procedure where you can do your plating internally. You still, by the way, you still need to lift the, the rib cage back into a line. You still need to reduce the fracture. And so you still need to be able to put something in externally. And what, what I suspect will happen is you, you'll be using some form of grasper externally to reduce your rib fracture while you internally plate. And, yeah. then, and it, it, it lends itself very nicely to, to a minimal access approach. Or robotic, robotic approach. Yeah. Gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you could be the first. Um, I know you said that you're fixing them around day eight, but is it ju just the logistics? Is your plan eventually uh, to do them uh, in the first 24 hours? Um, not always the first 24 hours, actually. We, the, the best time I find in my limited experience is about three to five days because they come in and they use your mess. And you've got you've got to fight you know fight over their, their bodies with the orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons etc. You know often they'll go to the ITU they'll get their secondary survey they'll settle um, and then you go in. So so very much I think it, this is a semi-elective operation or or within an urgent you know framework. It's not an emergency operation. And they, those patients are best avoided in general. The actual physical aspects of the rib fixation sooner the better because while the ribs are flopping in the breeze, they're very easy to fix. And the problem is if you leave it more than a week or so, they just start to to heal over. And we've had one or two now we've we've fixed at six months. You know because of non-union, essentially. And they're, they're, just, they're difficult, because you have to basically break and reset the ribs. And you sometimes wonder why you're doing it, you know, in terms of pain. So I think it will be a, an operation around three to five days, six days. That's the time frame I suspect will be of, of most use to us as thoracic surgeons to maximally benefit the patient with reducing the morbidities of the surgery. Okay. Yeah. Do you usually use the universal uh, plate, or do you use the rib-specific plates? I use a universal plate because I'm stupid and I often can't work out which, I can't, can't count the number of ribs and I can't work out which ones. So, I, uh, joking aside, I mean, the, the universal plate is, does, does what it needs to do, which you basically want three or four screws over, over the fracture site. And if you've got a rib which is common, you know, it's got several fracture sites along it, the universal plate lends itself because of its size to, f to plate you know, in two places. Um, I have used rib specific plates if, if, it's, if it's two or three uh, fractures which are close together. So you've kind of got a slight meatloaf effect on the rib and that's where a rib specific plate, which is much longer, is very much more effective. But generally the universal plate is just a simpler plate to use, I, I find. Because what I found is that when you fix them from outside, uh, the universal plate allows you to do a small incision and then you do every other rib 
And usually, if you have four, you yeah. fix two, and then everything stabilizes. Absolutely. And I think, you know, our, our, our very limited data shows that you, you, you're leaving behind nearly 50% of the rib fractures, actually, if you look at the numbers. We, I think we're, fi we're fixing probably a little bit more than, than when we first started. We've only been doing it a few years. I suspect we're fixing, on average, around four now, roughly. Um, but I suspect our patients have got six to seven, possibly eight rib fractures. So I think you're right. I think you are only fixing 50 to 60% of the ribs, because that's all that needs to be fixed. Because you're after stability, that's what you're after. The other interesting fact is that uh, when synthes was still synthes, I went to Germany when they first brought the kit out and they had a Dutch trauma surgeon who was doing a huge incision and at the posterior fractures, he was fixing the rib to the transverse process. Okay. So he's not going underneath. Mm. But his motto was always that you need a huge incision, a very big incision, which is gonna divide the muscles. And at the time I said to them, no, 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 no. And, um, but it's, it's the difference in approach. What I said about the orthopods. Okay. Uh, Rene, can I ask you um, about segmentectomy and port position? Because I recognised your port positions today from the videos that you've shown. So you showed a tri-segmentectomy, left upper lobe, and a, um, and a posterior right upper lobe segmentectomy through your traditional, or the, the, standard, the standardised anterior approach. When we've tried to use that for segment six, that's actually been quite difficult. And what we've done is moved our two inferior port positions backwards a little bit, so because we approach it from behind. Have you have you changed or your, your port positions depending on the on the segment? Was it well, I, I slightly, but yeah. mainly we use the same approaches for for lobectomies. But you have mm -hmm. a point there. I I've often wondered whether a posterior approach. Uh, Maybe better for for segment sex or, or for mm -hmm. even for lingualist bearing lobectomy because you get I've seen some of of, of, uh, of Bill's videos and you get mm -hmm. a really nice access you see all the vessels there so yeah. but I'm I'm used to the anterior approach. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes. What, 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 is it similar to what is going on in the yeah, UK? It's very similar, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we're doing it uh, together with the orthopedics, uh, but we're doing it in, in our theatre. So the orthopedics come to us. And uh, we have, as you know, we subspecialize. So, so one, of, uh, one of my colleagues is doing all the cases. So we try to collect all the experience in, in one person. So, but I think he's done 20, 25 now. We have quite a lot of traumas because we're level one trauma center. So we get from an area of 2.1 million people and we have a helicopter on the top floor, so. Great. Okay, um, well, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Ian. Thank thanks, me, for talking as well. Um, and that's it, end of the session.